أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله لك الحمد يا رب كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون I want to take this opportunity to welcome our respected brothers and sisters who have sacrificed their valuable time to be with us in this uh, series among the many topics we thought about, we thought of the topic, the fiqh of marriage, which can as well be translated as the jurisprudence of marriage. Fiqhu nikah au fiqhu zawaj. The reason why we gave it this kind of heading is to try as much as possible to be real because students of Sharia know the difference between the knowledge and the jurisprudence. These days, we are training our students as much as possible to address matters using the Fiki perspective. So when we come out with such a heading, the Fiki of marriage, it goes beyond the mere recitation of verses of the Holy Quran. It goes beyond the mere recitation of the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why are we saying that? There has been a lot of time that has passed since the end of the revelation of Quran. In the same way, there has been a lot of time that has passed since the first era of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the era of the rightly guided caliphs and even other successive eras of Islam which came later. But at the same time, humanity has continued to pass through a lot of changes. And one thing that has survived is Islam. We are Muslims. Now the question that comes in is, how are we going to practice our Islam that has survived across centuries despite the challenges despite the changes in the time and places. That is why we thought about this topic and we called it the fiqh of marriage, the jurisprudence of marriage. Now, I would like to start by giving a background to these sessions. Number one, I think we all agree that family is the strongest pillar of civilization. One of the philosophers made a point by saying, Man arada an yahdi mahavara, a person who wants to destroy a civilization, he takes any three, any of the three approaches or he targets any of the three institutions. Let me call them institutions. Number one, he targets family. And within a family, you don't have actually to target the entire family. To him, you just have to target the mother, you just have to target the wife. Because when you look deeply into the affairs of the family, you will come to the conclusion 
that the mother, that the wife is playing a central role in the success or the failure of the family. So a person who wants to target, to destroy a civilization, he targets the mother. The second pillar of civilization is the educational system. Because from the family, it is more like a conveyor belt. Have, after the family has taken or has played its role, there comes the role of an education system. Those ones who are coming from the psychological background, they know the nature and nurture concept. We start from the nurture, and that is the family, and then we start from the nature, and that is the family, and then after that we go to the nurture, that is the education, that is the environment, among other things. So a person who wants to destroy a civilization, after targeting the family, he is also targeting the environment which, within which a human being is living. Then the third one is target the role models. Those of you who are listening to us, you all know how important it is to have a role model. We are living at a time where we are, we are being made to believe that this is the way how we are supposed to behave because of so and so and so. And that's why I usually, I, I usually challenge some people that when you go back home, try to ask your children, for instance, that who is your role model? It will be a very big surprise to your child to say that my mom is my role model. My father is my role model. In many cases, they are referring to other people. The artists, the musicians, I don't know what, because it is a well-planned system. So when we come out to talk about the jurisprudence of marriage, we want at least to secure one of the pillars of civilization, and that is the family institution. Number two, when you look at what is going on today in the entire world, you will not be surprised that our perception of what marriage is, is differing from one individual to another. Yes, all of us know that we have Islam as a unifying factor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says among the last verses that were revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Today I have perfected my faith upon you. Today I have fulfilled my blessings upon you. I have chosen Islam as the best course. I have chosen Islam as the best path. So it means that we are supposed, by the way, to make sure that all our conduct, we are supposed to make sure that all our ways of behavior or behaviors or discipline are supposed to be regulated by Islam. But it is unfortunate that we have many things that are regulating our lives. When you look at the social media, what is going on, you will be surprised. Of course, many of the messages that we receive, we receive them, for instance, out of the films that we are watching. And these films are made to brainwash us. So that at the end of the day, Someone does not want his or her marriage to move according to the dictates and the teachings of Islam, but he wants them to move in accordance to what he may be, uh, to what, uh, what he watched when he was uh, having a certain movie. So this brings in another reason why we feel that this is the right time when we should start such kind of series in order to see how, how, what can we do in order to restore the situation? Then the other issue is, we all agree that the family structure now is under serious threat. I have a testimony over this. The few days 
the few months I have been the director of Sharia and Legal Affairs in the Office of the Supreme Mufti, 99% of the cases we are handling are cases of divorce. 99 of cases that we are handling are cases of divorce. And to make matters worse, when you look at the range, the age range, between 25 and 45, these are the people who are coming in, and their statement is one. We are not here so that we can see how we can mend our fences. We are not here to see how we can reconcile. The statement is one. If it is the woman who is petitioning, she says, I want a divorce. Can we come in to see how we can reunite? He says, no, enough is enough. I have come here. I just want a divorce certificate. Even when you go an extra mile to explain that, you know, since you are the one who is applying for divorce, from the Islamic perspective, you are supposed to return the mahar. You are supposed to pay back the mahar. The woman says, I am ready even if it, go, it means to go to the bank and take a bank loan. I'm ready, I'm fed up. So that is the situation. Now when you look at what is taking place, I think that is enough to the people of responsibility to make us come out and see really how much can we do? What contribution can we make in order to rescue the situation? So our intervention in this issue is coming from three dimensions. Number one, under our series, we want to harmonize the text, the spirit, and the reality. This is where many Muslims are going wrong. As I said, it's not enough to read for me the verse of the Holy Quran. Reading a verse is something, and understanding it is something else. Understanding the verse is also something, but also getting the suitable and the appropriate way of applying that verse is also something else. And even applying that verse on a particular situation might be something, but also its application in the time, space, dimension is also something else. There are many situations that we have received. Let me share with you something very simple. There is a prophetic hadith whereby the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that any wife who sleeps or any wives who spend a night and she had refused to have conjugal relations with her husband throughout the night and the husband is in need of him, so is in need of her, and then she refuses. The angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses that woman until morning. That is the text of the hadith. The hadith is authentic. The question comes, what was the background from which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that statement? Is it applicable even in a situation whereby the husband has annoyed the wife? Now, appreciating even the concept of conjugal rights, can you really make a conclusion that when the husband has not played his roles and then at night he comes to demand for his right and then the woman says, sorry, I'm not ready. You say that this is the text of the hadith. That's what brings in the concept. That's what brings in the fiqh of marriage. Understanding that. I remember some five years I was in South Africa and one of the professors was presenting on the topic of uh, fiqh sunnah understanding the sunnah. And he was on the subtopic which is called approach to hadith. How do we approach the hadith? And he made a statement that yes, Muslim scholars have given in a lot of effort to understand and appreciate the asbab al nuzul Why was this verse revealed? And 
how can we apply it basing on the reason of its revelation? But we have paid very little attention about Asbab Wurud al Ahadith. Why were these Ahadith narrated? Because understanding the context in which the Hadith was narrated, it also helps us to understand it, to interpret it, and also to apply it appropriately. And this is the background that we come from when we say fiqhu zawaj, the jurisprudence of marriage. So our role in our series is to harmonize between the text and even the spirit. Those of you who have some humble background of law, we always talk about the letter of the law and then the spirit of the law. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, but what is the underlying rationale behind this? That is the spirit now. Now, having appreciated the letter of the law, that is the text, you have also appreciated the spirit, now it comes in the issue of reality. Let me give you another example here. We all know in Islam, and that is now the text, once a husband has died, after his death, of course the property is distributed according to the Islamic law of inheritance. And each person takes a share. After this woman, that is the widow, had uh, observed the Ida period, in many cases it is four months and ten days because she's a widow, what is expected for her is to leave the matrimonial home. Because this house is among the disputable property. She could only be lucky if her share, that is one over eight, or one over four if the husband was not survived by any child, falls within her own share. Now look at our context in Uganda. Your mother and my mother, let me give an example on my mother. She was married at an age of 17. She's now clocking to 73, 75. Now my dad passes on. The Islamic rule of inheritance is that she's supposed to leave the matrimonial home. How do you look at that reality? Where is she going, first of all? You want to chase her so that she can go to her father's home? Even the people who are there, by the way, can hardly recognize her. Besides that, now where are you, where are you sending her? And that's why the jurisprudence of reality comes in. That's what we call fiqhul waqi. Can we look into this matter and ask ourselves, now, this is a widow, and uh, you know, she has lost all what it had. You know, she, she, she does not have anywhere to go now. How are we going to handle this within the context of Islam? So, our series of fiqh of marriage come from that background. You know, some time back, that issue came in, and it was like, tell all those old men, those old women, they should go back. And the question is, where are they going? Where are they going to? I was forced to write a research article about that, and it, was, it is soon to be published. How can we reconcile between the text, between the spirit, and between the reality? Another point here is that when we look at the new generation, the young generation, seriously speaking, the young generation is having a very serious challenge. Which course are they supposed to take? I had already showed you some of the forces that are driving them. You have the social media, you have the role models, you have the so-called what and what. So, when you look at what is taking place, you'll find out that the young generation is more on crossroad. We have some of them, when you even mention the issue of marriage, what they have learned about marriage before, by the way, joining it, it is just telling them that you better stay where you are. It is not a safe place to go, to go to. That is one side. 
But even when you look at those who are already there, once they start revealing to you what they are passing through, they are all about, we are on sober. You know, I remember one of my colleagues told me that, you see, Wallahi, in this kind of marriage, I am only praying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards me. Otherwise, I have not seen a benefit out of it. I don't know to what extent is that reality. But that's it. You are living a life of dissatisfaction. You are, lo you, you are living a life of uh, finding weaknesses from each other. Instead of coming together and find out that if this is my weakness, this is my strength, how can we come together so that we can mitigate? You have a weakness, I have a strength. I can come from this side, you can come from this, that side. So, our general objective here is to see how are we guiding the new generation? Not only that, but the third dimension is those who are already there. We need to guide them. We don't want to claim that we are the best, but we want also to make a, uh, to make, uh, to, to, uh, to, to make a contribution. Because as far as Sharia is concerned, I don't have to be the best so that I can guide. No, I don't have to. Each one has his own weakness. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have given me something like near perfection towards something and therefore I have an obligation to share it with others. So even those who are there, before they could come to a decision that for us enough is enough, we want to divorce, we feel that our sessions, our series will do a lot in order to rescue the situation. Having said that, I want now to share with you the marriage concept. What is marriage? We are now starting the fiqh itself, understanding it within the context. In our effort to understand what marriage is, we usually want to invoke what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا I happen to teach my students of Sharia some of the ayatul ahkam. And I always tell them that we need to give time to each and every statement from the Creator. When Allah is talking about the concept of marriage, this is what He chose to use, wamin ayatihi, among His signs. Just Take some time to think about that, that's, you know, that only statement among his signs. So meaning that if you are having interest into going into marriage, you are yet to fulfill one of Allah's signs. Is that small? Is that little? If you are already there, wamin ayatihi, you should actually be standing to celebrate. Who are you to be one of those fulfilling Allah's signs? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا Among the signs that show Allah's existence that he created مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Within yourselves. أَزْوَاجًا mates. Spouses. What is the purpose? So that you can seek, you can get calmness, you can get harmony, you can get tranquility, you can get all kind of rest within them. Then Allah says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ as one of the factors that is going to help you in order to achieve that, he made within you mawadda. Love, warahma, and mercy, inna fi dhalika la ayatil liqawmi yatafakkaroon. It is only people who contemplate that could get the meaning out of that. So that's a challenge. But just from the beginning of the verse, up 
appreciating the fact that marriage is one of Allah's signs. I usually tell my students, Anta khalifatullahi fil ard. You are Allah's vicegerent on this, on this world. But are you worth it? When you move around, can you really raise your hand? You can you raise your head and say, Here I am, Allah's vicegerent. Do you qualify? But that's the reality. Now bring the same analogy whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wamin ayatihi, among the signs of Allah's existence is marriage. So who are you really to be part of this? It simply means that it is something big. Now out of that, we just have to appreciate what is the secret behind marriage. The word zawj, the word marriage, the word fusion, it is what we want to look at. What are some of the elements that the moment we appreciate them, then we should start realizing how important, how significant the institution of marriage is. One, marriage is the secret of life. That's it. And that's why Allah confirms this in Surah Al-Dhariyat and he says, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ In each and everything, we made pairs. We made mates. In each and everything. Now look around and find out what is something that is giving anything that is substantive, that is beneficial, and it's not in pairs. So when we start appreciating that from that background and we transfer that meaning to marriage, then we shall be on the right course of appreciating how significant this institution is. When you appreciate that marriage is about pairing, marriage is about fusion, you come to a conclusion that the institution of marriage is about building synergies. It's about building strength. It's about recognizing that al kamalu lillah, perfection is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. You might be appreciating someone from a certain corner, but he's also having a weakness from another corner. By the way, the only reason why you got married to that person whom you see some imperfection so that you can see how you can build up so that you can be perfect. So marriage comes from that background that it is building the synergies. It is building the strength. Marriage is about appreciating the beauty of difference. That's it. In many cases, you know that we have the male, we have the female. We have the tall, we have the short ones. We have the black, we have the whites, and so on. The fact that your height is that of American does not make you exceptional. Otherwise, I always ask students, if within the vicinity you are living in, there were no short people, how would you appreciate that for you, you are tall? So you need the short one in existence so that you can appreciate your height. And that's the beauty. Otherwise, you will find out that that is one of the beauties of difference. That is why, suppose that in the whole world we are all whites, we are all brown. It will lose meaning. If we are all black, the same, and so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings in the concept of marriage so that we can appreciate the differences. And within that difference, that is the secret of uh, life as we have said. Another issue here is interdependence. That we go into the marriage institution because we appreciate that we are not perfect. Each person has to benefit from another. I remember some time back, I was passing through 
one of the writings of the great men and one of the statement is there is nothing on this universe that was created to serve its own purpose. There is nothing on this universe that Allah created so that it can serve its own purpose. It's not there. He gave some common examples which we all know. The rivers don't take their own waters. It is other people who come and take it. You know, the lakes don't consume their own fish. It is other people who come and take it. When you move around and you find a beautiful flower, the flower does not benefit from its own good looking. It is you who appreciates it. The sun that comes every morning and sets in the evening, it is us who get the benefit. That is the secret of life. The secret of creation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you so that you can serve the interest of others. So stop looking at yourself as Mr. Perfect, Madam Perfect. If you see my imperfection, that's why you are created. You are created so that you can come and help me so that you can at least scale down on my weakness. That is marriage. We come from that background because we have actually appreciated and recognized the fact that we are not perfect, we are not, you know, we are not all strong, and so on and so forth. Now, going forward, we need to appreciate the values of an Islamic marriage. That is the first thing. I always say that, yes, a lot of things is a lot is going to take place but one thing that we must secure that we must make sure that it survives the values of our islam if i may ask these days many of you are attending weddings you are attending introductions wallahi i say this with a lot of uh, dismay with a lot of disappointment. What is that distinctive characteristic between an Islamic marriage and a non-Islamic marriage? Because from the beginning up to the end, you actually rarely distinguish. The only distinction that you can find, maybe it comes within the Kadari. This is where you see that maybe this net somehow this might be a Muslim wedding, and even they also bring the element of a sheikh who is going to say a word of wisdom to the newly wed couple. But even by the time they tell the sheikh to come and make a statement, subhanallah, a lot has taken place. You know, they have hired like three musicians, the bride and groom have danced and they are exhausted. Now, as it is almost going to Maghreb, they say, even our sheikh has come, let us give the sheikh some time so that he can give a word of what? Wisdom, a word of Islam to the, to the couple. To make matters worse, as you are making your statement, now, the camera people are also telling that, no, this is the right direction, for, you know, there is a lot and a lot of disturbances. So, going forward, we need first of all to appreciate the values of Islamic marriage. That is the first thing. Number two, our strongest prayer is that we move away from the world of theory to the world of practice. One of the verses of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they were doing what they were being told, it is not if they were listening, if they were hearing, but if they were doing what they are being told, that one would have been better for them and it would have served a greater and greater purpose. Another thing going forward is we need to appreciate 
the underlying rationality of the rulings of Sharia. Those of you who are going to be with us in our classes, insha'Allah ta'ala, we are going to try as much as possible to investigate what is what we call the maqasid sharia When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, allowed you to make a choice of a husband or of a wife, and he talked about such and such characters, characteristics, and so on, or attributes, what was the underlying rationality? Why was it mentioned? That is where we want, inshallah, to put a lot of our emphasis. But also the third one, as I have said, we need to appreciate the context. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we need to appreciate the fact that a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have changed. I want to share with you just one example as I'm winding up our introductory lecture. We were in one of the annual Ramadan conversion two years back, I think. And then the question came in. I think it was Dr. Madina, the director of Females Campus, who was presenting that suppose my wife is working at Islamic University in Uganda which we know very well that it is an Islamic university. And you know that the ruling of Sharia, the woman should not travel in such a distance of one day, one night, without the company of the Dhu Mahram. And in another hadith, a woman shall never isolate with a member of an opposite sex, except the third one is shaitan. Then the person asked, do I have a legal obligation on each and every day to accompany my wife if she's working with IU, IU? Not only accompanying her, but all, all, I also have to ask which office is she sitting in so that they should also create another seat for me because I'm the mahram. I'm supposed to guard her. That is the text of the hadith. That is the text of the law. Now, I remember Dr. Madina saying that for that one, I think we have to refer it to the issues, the, the, the people of Sharia. And this brings in the issue of the context. The issue of the context. Under what circumstances did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talked about that hadith? Also another one. You also need to appreciate the fact that after some time the Prophet also made another hadith and said that maybe time shall come when a woman shall move from Yemen and then she goes to Mecca to perform Hajj. And there is nothing that she's scared of apart from maybe the wild animals along the way. Now, you have one hadith which says that the woman should always move in a company of a mahram. And you have another hadith which says that time shall come when she shall be free to move alone. How do you harmonize between the two vis-a-vis -vis the context of a woman working in IU, IU? These and many other cases we are likely, inshallah, to handle in our jurisprudence of marriage. As I'm summing up, the last point is our sessions or our people who are attending our sessions should be ready to appreciate what is the fiqh of the marriageable age. For instance, what is it? We are living in Uganda. You know that the minimum consent age is 18 years, isn't it? Should you, find, should you be found making nikah with a girl who is below 18, you know where to end to. That's it. 
Now, we have had many police intervening and frustrating such marriages. And sheikhs have come out to say that for us, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married Aisha when she was at the age of nine years, <laughs> six years. Then he went into the conjugal relations with her at an age of nine. So someone who is marrying 14, I think he is above the needful. <laughs> Isn't it? Now the question will come, how do you appreciate that context? How do you look at it? And when the laws of Uganda have said 18, Muslims in Uganda, do we have to agree or to disagree? Among many and many other issues that we shall be looking at. We shall be looking at the jurisprudence of uh, khitbah. That is proposal. There is a lot that is going on. As far as Islamic law is concerned, the moment I make a proposal to a certain woman, to a certain young girl, others are not allowed to make proposal on the same. Now, how do you, how do you define a valid proposal? How do you distinguish it from an invalid one? You know these days, it is as simple as having my phone and then I send a text and I'm proposing. So to what extent, or oh, at which extent shall we say that now this is a valid proposal and once that valid proposal is registered as such, then it is bearing others from making a same proposal over the same woman. This is all about the fiqh. Finally, I think this is where we are having very many challenges. We are having these challenges because we have a lot that we are, you know, importing, you know? And we have a lot of stories that we are listening to. You reach home, one of the couples will tell you that I always wash the dishes with my husband. Fine, that is your home, it's not my home. You know, the other one says that, you know, my husband helped me in this and that. And then you want to think that whatever is taking place in family A, it should also be copied and cut and put in family B. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, says that, Arrijalu qawamuna ala nisa Men, we are the guardians. And he mentioned the reason, because we are the providers. We are the maintainers. The situation has now changed. You are going out for work. I'm going out for work. So it goes back to us to try to go back to our home and see how are we now going to reorganize our intermarital roles. Rather than saying that you are not laying down, you are not preparing food for me, you are not doing this and that. By the way, when you are even forgetting that some of the house chores, it is not a legal obligation of the wife to carry them on. So, our fiqh, our jurisprudence of marriage is yet, inshallah ta'ala, to address all those issues. I want to end at this point because this is our introductory lecture and I thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We thank you, the participants who are coming. Um, just before I move any further, this is important uh, for us to know. It's going to be like a class, uh, but the attendance is institution free. And we pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us be in position to be part of this program. We are in the Every Tuesdays, 4.30 immediately after us, we shall be coming. And maybe it starts uh, an approximate of, uh, I think the rough picture is 40, 45. And online we have uh, 60. And doctor, we are having 103 participants. Inshallah, sure. that's a good number to start. Mm -hmm. Online is my, my father. I will call him my father. Imam Eid Kasozi. Imam Eid, thank you for being part of this. Mm -hmm. Also online, uh, uh, brother, very many of you are online. 
Uh, I would like to invite, uh, sorry, the Zoom participants. Let me first give the chance to uh, the participants who are in house. Uh, that has been the speech of Doctor. It is going to be a lecture series. Uh, it was just giving the introduction. But if you have uh, one point in a second to put across, please, uh, you can understand. We are not getting you. That there is a cloud for someone to make khutbah uh, without going into through a mahram or making you ask a hand in marriage a girl or any any person you wish to marry. Then you, you ask this person face to face or using a phone without passing through a mahram. That's my question. Thank you. Barakallah, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Brother Luzi, I think that was Brother Luzi. Let's have Brother Mayambara uh, to also uh, ask. Yes, Brother Mayambara, are you online? Yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa I take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this program. My point is only, only thanking the selection of the topic and being presented by the right person. I think if we uh, more we, we, we give more advertising about this, we benefit the community. <coughs> Thank you. Jazakallah uh, khair. That aspect will be answered. I want to think uh, Imam Kasos wants to say something. And <coughs> Imam, you have the floor. Imam? Hey, can this be me? Hello, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi No, why do, why do you want to think? <laughs> I am just attending like any other person. Uh, I, mean, I only will wish to, to thank Sheikh and I'm just looking forward to, uh, to be part of the class. I hope I should get the time. Uh, since the uh, uh, 4 p.m. is convenient for me, I hope I will be able to be available every every Tuesday so that I learn more. Uh, I only want you to answer the question that someone has posed. How do we have it is there in the, in the chat? It's a very interesting question. The Shumaya says in Timakfa because that may don't know how to be husbands. But she she's very unfortunate <laughs> because when she was choosing a husband, she may have chose money, well a big house, a big car, and she forgot to choose a Muslim husband. <laughs> yeah, you see. So I I just want to hear the answer from the Sheikh. But yeah. I'm only is saying sorry for her mm. because of choosing <laughs> a wrong husband uh, who did not learn how to be husband. But <coughs> men don't, don't take all of us to be. And I'm a man, and now you can probably say that I'm a good husband. <laughs> 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 uh, I think from that uh, we can take, uh, I, I think doctor is having it. The time, uh, I want to echo the time that shared men do not know how to be husbands, the Arabi is there a way that we, they can be guided before they enter the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. And before Chef answers that, the quick answer is she should attend this session. Mm -hmm. And sure. he should tell the husband to attend this session. So, uh, I think uh, that's the question, maybe this one. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I have doctor for the introduction. I think it was a doctor for the introductory session. Uh, kindly request that the sessions are both in English and Uganda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's always good to hear doctors speaking the local dialect. Mm. Um, uh, I think, doctor, because of time and because uh, of the issues that are surrounding us, we shall give you time to answer that. But this quick one of the dialect. Of course, before we began, uh, 
the program, we did a lot of pre-study and we selected English for very many reasons. And we are very sure if you want the Uganda dialect, there are a lot of dalsus where you can have the Uganda dialect, but there are few dalsus where we have the English dialect. So we need to give the brothers who are English oriented the chance also to be part of the girls. Uh, and also to note this class has registration. It is a class. It's not That's why Sister Shamin Katende is the one who is in charge of our registration. Yes, Doctor, uh, the questions from uh, the audience. Um, Zakmullah Khairan. I wish to thank the audience for making time to attend this session and uh, we also commit ourselves that inshallah we shall be continuing on each and every Tuesday. I think that uh, we received two questions. Number one is uh, uh, how can we make uh, uh, the kind of the khitbah that is the proposal uh, maybe using uh, the current uh, technology through SMS, maybe the WhatsApp, among others, and uh, is it valid from uh, the Islamic uh, perspective? Uh, in uh, an attempt to answer this, I wouldn't first of all like to preempt the uh, coming sessions, because each and every bit we are going to have its own jurisprudence. So when we are come to the extent or to the level of saying of uh, addressing or discussing the fiqh al khitba, you know, the jurisprudence of a proposal, it has its own teachings. There is a lot and a lot, a lot that, inshallah, we are yet to learn when we reach there. But just to make <coughs> a general statement on this that should prepare our questioner to be ready for that session. You know, we have to balance between two situations. Number one, the sensitivity and significance of the marriage institution. That some scholars, I have ever read an article of one scholar from Malaysia. And uh, his approach or his conclusion was marriage is so sensitive, is so significant that any issue within marriage should not be belittled to an extent that it is concluded by a mere SMS, by a mere WhatsApp. In other words, to such a scholar, he's looking at Wamin ayati hi. You are talking about you are talking about Allah's sign, and this is what you want to initiate with an SMS. This is what you want to initiate with a WhatsApp message. So to him, the institution of marriage is so significant and sensitive that he does not admit that a proposal could be made by such online. Uh, maybe communications. But also we need to balance on the other side that among the issues that Islam made is to simplify the marriage itself. Simplicity. And technology has actually come in order to simplify life. That if I am here and I have got enough information about a certain lady in the United States of America, then until when shall I wait in order to get money for the etiquette and so on and so forth, the visa complications and so on, so that I can go and deliver my physical proposal. So, within that balance, this is where we have to move in. In other words, I don't want to preempt that discussion because it is also another fiqh and we shall be looking at when we say that we have allowed, or when we say that it is okay, we can uh, make a proposal with an SMS, what is the implication? For instance, uh, these days, those the WhatsApp users, 
we have come to appreciate that when you have the blue tick, then it is what? Received. But you know that others have customized the, their, their phones that actually they can be two, but they have already seen it. Now the thinking of khitbah is, you must ensure that the message is delivered. Now within that context, are you sure it was seen or it was not seen? That's where we come in from. And when you, are, when you are sure that now it has been seen, what should be the allowance of time given to the recipient so that you can know your fate, whether it was rejected or it was admitted? So, trying to move within that balance, inshallah we shall come to the conclusion to that. The second question, of course, as said about... Uh, Men are not good husbands. No, 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 doctor, before that, yes. brother, you say, actually, he's our international participant. Mm. He's abroad. Yes. He's just saying, and for me, you have said it, but I need you to give me a quick one. Okay. Is it allowed to make chutzpah mm. without a matter? That one, can't we get a yes or no? And then during the lectures, we shall get it. <laughs> mm. Okay, you mean uh, making uh, a khitbah without a mahram? Yes, that's his question. Okay, I think we need to move into the steps of the khitbah. Because the khitbah means a marriage proposal. Isn't it? Now, the marriage proposal starts, the first stage is to identify the person you want to propose to. You know? And in many cases, by the way, the first step is to appreciate the characters. You know? That's why at a later stage, that is when Islam allows you to have a closer proximity so that you can appreciate others, the physical and so on and so forth. So if it, if it is about making a khitbah without a mahram, by the way, in many cases, a proposal does not necessarily call for the presence of the mahram. You know? The mahram is needed when you now want to appreciate the beauty and other things concerning this what? This lady. I think I have answered that. But of course, with other details. Now, okay. The second question concerning uh, uh, men are not good husbands? Is that the question? First, I would wonder which scientific method used to reach that conclusion. <laughs> that is one. Number two, I think this brings in the relevance of these uh, sessions. We might be accusing men of not being good husbands. Men are accusing women of not being good wives. That is number two. Number three, we might be accusing either parties, but because they have not received what makes a person a good husband. One of the principles of Islam is وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسولا. We are not to accuse, we are not to punish until we send a messenger. And the messenger is the fiqh of marriage. That now men need to listen to find out what makes a man a good one? And women also have to listen so that they can know what makes a good uh, wife. At the end of the day, once, inshallah, we come to appreciate this, then at the end of the day we shall be seeing that now you are good to such an extent and you are not good at such an extent. And by the way, the moment we make that conclusion, then we shall be making one statement that we are human beings because perfection is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukran. Uh, 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 dear participants, uh, thank you very much for attending. Because we are time bound, our, our, our ICT really needed to time us. As you said, it's now six. We have to come to the conclusion. But before we come to the conclusion, everyone will go back home and think out what you have learned. Personal have learned perfection. It's for me, Allah, and I've appreciated that the reason we marry is to actually understand that we are not perfect. And if homes can have that 
kind of uh, mindset that none of us is perfect and we are just there actually to help those who we think are imperfect to be perfect. I think we shall all be perfect. We shall have time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we have our ICT from Islamic University in Uganda. They have set the ICT gadgets here. Thank you very much, the ICT team. Uh, the Al Hidaya Media, uh, Brother Rajam Chigozi, is also with us to make sure that uh, the online accessibility of this uh, lecture is with us. Uh, you can go to the Al Hidaya Media uh, social web, web pages on their Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and WhatsApp. You will be in position to get these uh, lectures. You can also, inshallah, please visit Abdul Hafiz Wadusimbi's Facebook. Uh, page, you, we are going to upload these lectures there. Yeah? Uh, Abdul, Dr. Abdul Hafiz doesn't want to be a, a, a dot com man, but we shall force him to be dot com. Uh, that's why we want to open a YouTube for him, and all of this uh, should be on his YouTube, inshallah. Yes, Brother Gaffa must be in position to work on that because he's now uh, the one who is in charge of uh, Dr. Hafiz's media. We want to make sure that these ones are good. So you can go to al with Media. Also, Saluh Islamic Dawa group is also getting us covered. And this will be enough because our role is to actually have the classroom environment. Because the Sahadas will very well understand they have their teachers where they used to learn from. You can hear the also our Imams, the Abu Hanifas the Shafi, the Hambalis, they used to have students. And we can't let this doctor peace go without us being these students. Thank you very much for attending. Till next Tuesday, the Ibn Rahman. Same time, inshallah, the same thing. Subhana Rabbi Karabbi Rehzat Alhamdulillah. To our online audience, it has been a pleasure. We have hosted a 63 on record first attendance. And inshallah, all of you who have been online, Sister Sarah Nantongo, Salma Chigoz Moses, Sister Zahra Kruenza, Sonia Nsubuga, Ratim, everyone, it has, uh, it has been really... Ihsan Malik from oh, Pakistan. Oh, brother Ihsan Malik from Pakistan. Thank you very much uh, for being part of our group. Actually, I'm very well aware that part of the brother Sega was most, uh, who is actually a uh, student here, uh, Sister Shahada. I, I very well understand most of you online are actually from abroad. Thank you very much for following Dr. Abdul Hafiz. Brother Isan Malik, it has been a pleasure uh, to share with you this. Till next time, Subhanallah, Rabbi Laizat Allah, Maya Spoon, Assalamu alaikum, Mursaleen, Walhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, Wassalamu alaikum, Warahmatullahi, Wabarakatuh.